You know what? Your peep this. Lottie Dottie. We like to party. We don't cause trouble. We don't bother nobody. We're just some men that's on the mic. And when we rock up on the mic, we rock the mic. Right? For all of y'all, keeping y'all in hell. Welcome to the Bronx Hip Hop Oral History Project. Today is Friday, May 24th, 2024. I'm Pastor Crespo Jr., the research librarian for the Bronx County Historical Society. Today, I am joined by Grandmaster Jerry Fast Feet Fontanez, also known as Fast Feet Fontanez, a world champion martial artist, a black belt, an entrepreneur, a businessman, a dancer, and a b-boy who was down with the rock steady crew. Welcome, Fast Feet. It's my pleasure. I'm honored. I'm happy this is happening. Great, great, great to have you here. Can, can we start out by you telling us where do your parents come from? So my mother's from Rio Piedra, Puerto Rico. My father is from, I can't even freaking pronounce it, Obra Montaña. And he, he lived there that long. But um, they both came to um, Manhattan, New York City, in the early 1950s. Mine was born in 49. Yeah, they were both born in 49. So, so I was born in, in the Mount Sinai Hospital. Grew up in 119 between second and third, and we moved in 1971 from El Barrio over to South Bronx, South South Bronx. And reason being was because these these young Puerto Rican guys took some garbage and put it across Third Avenue and burned it, called the Young Lords. And the National Guard was out there, so we couldn't go to the movie theater to see um, Correa Coto or Mi Macara over at the Cosmo Movie Theater on 16th Street. <laughs> And um, so mom just wanted a better, you know, life for myself and my younger brother at the time, he was born that same year. So we moved up to Sheridan Avenue, 164th Sheridan, which was cultural change for me because in Barrio, of course, you predominantly Puerto Rican around you and always, there's always a Cuban in the corner that, that has a store or what have you during that time. I was born on um, January 10th, 1966, just to give you. So I'm five years old, relocated to the Bronx and they have these gangs. I'm like, not gangs that I was used to. The Renegades of Harlem was my cousins that had the duplex right there Second Avenue in 119, but they had the Savage Nomads and the Savage Skulls and the Outlaws. And um, and then they had a young version, the Young Lords. I should say, I should say, the Young Skulls and the Young Nomads and so on and so forth and the baby ones. So they had like baby, young, and the so-called, you know, wow. I guess preteen, teen, and adult gangs. I heard of the Ghetto Brothers, and I went over to Webster Avenue and, and hung out with my, my cousins over there. So it was a cultural change, man. But this was the interesting part. We were the third Latino family to move into the building, to Roxy's Mansion. And um, the first one was the Super, of course. Superintendent is, is going to be the first Latino that moves in the building. <laughs> and um, it, was, it, it, was, it was a cultural change. So every Saturday, every weekend, I used to make sure I went back body when I was used to take the, the four train to the six train by the time I was 10 years old I was traveling doing that you know which, which is kind of crazy when I think about it mom uh, mom and dad never we, we never lived with dad you know he was incarcerated in 71 I met him in 74 at the feds building in Manhattan and it was interesting because mom told him hey he, he likes to do karate and she signed me up April 19th, 1976, to Sang Su Tiger Kim's. At the time, they called it Korean Karate, which ended up being Taekwondo. But the ad didn't say that. It said Karate, Kung Fu, had, had everything. You know? Back then, if you did Karate, that wasn't cool because it came from Kung Fu. You know? mm. So we did the whole thing. And, um, but by the time I got to that school, I already had the full split. I already had worked out a bunch of people. And we also young in the workout that one time I told my friend, hey, when well, we're gonna go make out again. That's how naive I was a young kid that was, that wanted to be like initially Kung Fu, David Carradine. But I used to see Agent 99 on Get Smart chopping people in the neck. I used to see Mrs. Peel on the Avengers kicking people too. And Captain Kirk, you know. Right, right. These are the first people that I saw doing what would have been martial arts and, 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 and a version of that maybe in, in some of the 007 movies. 
You know, so it was it was fascinating to me. But when I saw the movie Five Fingers of Death that same year, oh, that's it. I became the karate fever boy. Because now playing cops and robbers became you shot at me and I blocked you with my iron fist. I shot you, no, you didn't. I blocked it. Right. I got iron fist. The, the, it can't get through. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how crazy that was. But um yeah, I have I have one younger brother who passed away. And um like Yeah, thank you. And he um he was probably the most talented person I ever met. Uh, for example, I rhymed in nineteen ninety one. I started writing some rhymes to pretty much a therapy, and I would repeat a rhyme I would do. He won. He kept doing my rhyme. I said, "Bro, make your own rhyme." He wanted to share my rhyme, so I said, "Make your own rhyme." Within a year and a half, he was signed and had a record out. Wow. Yeah. So that that was. The, the example. People with so much talent with any guidance and forget about it. That just goes to having the handbag. And um but yeah, I'm a proud Taino. You know, understand that I'm a Borinquen from the Iro island, Borinquen. I'm a Borinquen from they from Borinquen. And um here in America they probably call it Arawak. Well Arawak in this part of the right, right, right. So I try I try to study to try to break down you know, what I was, it was confusing, you know. My mother was Light, light on me, so that's say she was white and my grandmother was black, so I'm in the middle. Okay, and we always have to deal with that. We were white or black, we were other, right? Yeah, we have to put other, right? That's part of my rhymes, too, because why we got to be other? We everything, we other, we both, you know. Yeah, yeah. did your mother ever talk talk about Rio Piedra and what life no, was no, like? No, no, because she brought up, she was brought up here, she was brought up here, but okay, she can, I can say that my great. Great grandmother, which is her great grandmother, was literally never living in the house. She lived in the hut outside. She had the long hair. She was a real Taino, and she refused to be colonized. So she kept that. But but somewhere along yeah. the line, they didn't give it. She she didn't teach them any of the words, the culture, anything like that. Got it. You know, once, once they got once they got the Spanish and them, they they eliminated. It. So but so she didn't say that much about that. But she was big. She was one of the first baddest sites like that. So Eddie Torres is known as the Mambo King. Her and Eddie used to dance as teenagers in Spanish Harlem. So mom when it came as an example, if you go if you go to Orchard Beach and they have the seniors dancing, you know those are the baddest and they got they got a contest sometimes, uh -huh. right? Well she won the contest with some person she just met, not even a partner. Sweet. That's how bad my mom was. You know, she just passed away, which you know, it's crazy. She nicknamed me eight uh, on September 18th, 1981, she nicknamed me Fearless Fast Feet. Wow. I said, Mom, I will always be fearless, but let's use first name Fast, last name Feet. They're going to make fun of me because I know I would. Right. Last name Fontenay, you freaking, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the snapping is part of hip hop, guys, and I'm still one of the baddest at snapping. That's right. Wow, that's right. <laughs> so it was your grandparents that came here from Puerto Rico to New York? The first person that came was my great grandmother. Okay. And then everybody followed suit. My grandmother, I never met my grandfather. Did they tell you what decade? Oh, I, I know it's 54. 1954. Yeah, so they came in the first generation of what would have been that, that the biggest rush of there was no work in the island anymore. Right? So they took what would have been the industrial work and relocated it and or just got rid of it. Right. So people were forced to go. That's why New York, New Jersey, and Hawaii is where they transplanted people because the Garden State, so they were able to be the farmers, the heroes that they were. Right. Yeah, but then they came to Spanish Harlem, which was where the bulk of us came. Got it. Got it. Now, what, what type of music were you exposed to at home? Mom was Motown and... La Fanny All Stars, right? So, so whether it was salsa, or she wasn't big into what I would consider um, pop music. We used to watch it on the television. Of course, radio used to be originally ABC. Mm -hmm. you know, you know, so it used to be what we used to listen to: rain drops keep falling on, right? Right. But once it changed to FM, from AM to FM, it became a whole different world. So. She was big into, I have all the original 
my, my grandmother too. You know, I it was interesting. Joe Batan was there. I remember Joe Batan's album. My grandmother had them all. It was a Boogaloo and, and a Joe Cubas, you know, and like I said, in the, the Hector La Rose. But at the same time, we had all the Motown. Mom, predominantly, I would say that 60% of the time she played um, English and the other 40% in the weekends was more the side side, but I hated the side side until I did it, until right. I loved it. And it was because it was corny because it was Spanish to me. You know, Spanish to me was like corny. Right. You know, which is interesting. Now it's even it's even worse because I wish I knew my native tongue. The only word that I know is Hamaka. <laughs> anything besides that, I don't know. And, and we you know that we, that's that's a that even word, but anything besides that, I have no idea. But I'm gonna look into it. That's right. Yeah. America hammock came from the word hamaca, from the Taínos. Yeah, that, that's it. Now, what was a typical meal at home, and what was your favorite? Rocabi chuela, always of course, rice as the rice and beans. But I don't know why I was addicted to freaking anything with sauce. So whether it was carne guisa or pollo guisa, right. You know, the, the, I, I lean towards that. But then when I got older, just because of that, and this was a mistake at the time, I believed it was true. So I became a fighter. He said, you need to have meat in your, in your diet because the animal kingdom. Uh -huh. And um, so we have steak and eggs for breakfast as often as possible. I can imagine what it did to my, my blood, right? But uh -huh. back then, you're young enough to be able to do that. Medium rare, of course, because the vitamins were there. So years after, uh, November of 88, everything all changed. I stopped eating meat, um, red meat or pork, and then for 10 years, I didn't even eat chicken, which soon I'll go back to not eating that too, right. because, you know, we, we have problems that don't happen hereditary as culturally, and that's because of the eating habits, not right. the diet, because diet means you're going to die. That's when you get on a diet, you don't want to hold it, because they feel like you're going to die. Mm. So <laughs> all right. But, um. Yeah. Oh, and pizza. Come on, man. You got to have pizza. Anything with pasta, right? That's the closest thing to the I think, I, I think, but, but my favorite, presently, sushi, baby. So sushi, really? It, sushimi, really. Because I rather not have the rice. I hear you. I hear you. Yeah. Now, but before breaking, do you recall any family gatherings or man, dances? Man, you kidding me? Every, every, you know, Puerto Ricans, or anyway, people from the ghetto are going to party for a celebration or for mourning. Any way you put it, you're going to find a reason to party. So my mother had parties just, they call them get-togethers. The get-togethers happened just about every freaking weekend. And I was allowed to stay up because I was a bartender. That's how I made some money too. Uh -huh. Someone told me, give me two fingers of this and the, and the splash of that. And I knew how to make my drinks already. I made my dollar here, dollar there. Yeah, so I've always been an entrepreneur. But um, house parties, of course, and then you have these other parties that were religious parties from Santeria that if you had, if anyone had anyone in their family knew that they got these freaking big jams and scared the crap out of you, but but they're doing a different type of music where they're playing live music. And then when you would go over to the festivals, the fairs always had someone on stage. You you would see in the Bronx, the heck that I was, the Santa Cruz, who lived in the damn Bronx. We had no idea that was the case yeah. during that time. Even Tito Rodriguez, Tito Puente, all these guys were living. Tito Rodriguez was interesting because he had a TV show that we watched in the 60s and 1960s out of his home in Puerto Rico. And then years after, he moved over here to New York, too, because New York was just a spot. Right. You know, they had um, the Prospect Palace, which was the, the, the equivalent to the Palladium from Manhattan. But that was the Boogie Down Bronx location where all of them had a ch chance to be in this big stage. Right. So going back to Mario Bausa and, and, and um, Machito, which is the first generation of what would be Afro-Cuban jazz, which then become mambo slash side side years after and a whole bunch of stuff. But, so right. I try to try to learn what the heck are we, you know, with this melting pot of some incredible stuff. I don't understand even what prejudice was until I left New York City. Right. You know, it, it was crazy. Like we, we were part of a, a, a big, this big gumbo of all these different musics and, and, and dancing and, and, and just movement. And just styles. My mom had a big afro. You know, she could hold the afro. Mine, Sweet. I tried to put mine up. I had a Puerto Rican afro, so it was the DA I used to fall to the side. So <laughs> I didn't just keep it that way. You know, when we to blow our hair, you know, in the, in the 1970s during, you know, staying alive. With he was, you know, he was supposed to be locking. Right. 
Imagine that. That's what he was trying to do. He was supposed to be locked, but he just couldn't do it. <laughs> so that was like the American, I should say, the that Hollywood Terrier version. failed him. That, yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> it, it, it's crazy. Um, but it, it, it's interesting. But, yeah, because television also, we watched Solid Go. That Solid Go was huge when we got a chance to see, right, right. listen to the pop music, but also see the dances. And you see that, you just picture that one tour, beautiful, you know, Afro, Tell anyone be Afro. She had no Afro, right? <laughs> <laughs> but just television was was influential. Even hot hot tracks. When hot tracks. When we started seeing those videos, that was freaking huge. And we started seeing. That's when we started seeing some breaking in there. But the first time I heard of breaking, or what would have been hip hop, the L Brothers. What the L Brothers? The L Brothers. And 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 um, I got to give them props because I live. You know, I'm 64 in Sheridan, so we didn't hear the stuff on the west side. They were closer to us. They were from the you know, Forest Project. Right. And that group, me and Gene is the oldest brother. The, but Gene Livingston. Cordio, I'm not sure what's his, what his real name, but his last name is Livingston, too. And then Grand Wizard Theodore, the youngest brother of the three, who invented the scratch. They had a guy that was partners with me and Gene called Grandmaster Flash. And eventually, the L Brothers become two groups, right. the Furious Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five, and Grand Wizard Teal, Theodore and the Furious uh, and the Fantastic Five. And in the Fantastic Five, I have my favorite two, Whip a Whip, because he's Puerto Rican. Yeah, I said it. Mm-hmm. I had to identify with somebody, and then Ruby D is my name, and I'm a Puerto Rican. You might think I'm black by the way that I'm speaking, Ruby D. That's right. You know, of course, they weren't the, the, the only ones. You had Charlie Chase also. And then before that, there was a guy named Tex. It was it was um, Disco King Mario, Sinbad, and Tex. And Tex, I don't remember his first name, but his last name is Montalvo, just so you know. So that means he had to have some little, you know, he's Puerto Rican dude from Bronx Dale. Got it. So Bronx Dale, Projects, Disco King Mario, 1971. Even right. before Cool Herc, he Cool Herc used to come to those parties where it was outside. So the differences in hip hop, and this is a bit, you know, challenge, challenge recently. Yeah, they give 1973 the date, you know, and others say well that was before that, and they say Disco King Mario couldn't be hip hop because his name was Disco. Well, everything was Disco back then. Everything. Everything was Disco. So the Disco Three became the Fat Boys. You know, so disco was what where we were at in terms of music. If you was old enough to go to the clubs, have those um, party shoes and party socks. Right, right. We were too young, so we had to have our own parties outside or in the gangs that had their clubs. Okay. You know, they, they, but um, yeah. So nineteen, I think nineteen seventy six was when I heard about the Hot Brothers. Wow. In seventy six, and I remember again around seventy seven. This guy actually started breaking, breaking. Not doing like what we were doing. We were doing like just like a four-step run around and just spin on your butt. Is that the first time you saw The first time breaking? I seen a B-boy like really get down had to be Prince Thunder Rock. Prince Thunder Rock, man. And he was, it was crazy because he did a head spin. I was like, what the hell is that? <laughs> and he talked about some dude named Spy, you know, that he, that, that he knew, which I never saw Spy too many years after or even met Spy. But Prince Thunder Rock, 1976, 77 was the first time I ever saw breaking me. What, what we would consider he did a swipe into a head spin. And, and like, like he was so advanced. When I think about it, he was so advanced. But he was a great MC, too. Right. And a little Puerto Rican kid that really, he, he, I don't know, he's like, he, was, he was from the future. <laughs> he was from the future because he was, he was like, when you consider the epitome of what hip hop would be today, the whole thing, he was—he he had the attitude. The be- b-boy, the b-boy yeah, but, swag. But, but, but that swag, but on a whole other level, like, in other words, it was magnified on a whole other level before everybody else. Prince Thunder Rock was Prince ahead of his Thunder time. Prince Thunder Rock, bar none, ahead of his time because he, he could write graph too. His brother was Eddie TGB. So he was a big graffiti writer. Um, but... Yeah, that, that, the whole family, that they, they, they had 
a bunch of brothers and make a little break and flip. Right. Gymnastics. Oh my God. Before we get deeper in, into hip hop, could you tell me a little bit about your neighbor? You were young when you moved to Sheridan Boulevard. So uh, yeah. tell so, me about so Sheridan Avenue, Sheridan, 1971. Sheridan Avenue. You go there and there's Roxy's Mansion. By the time, you know, and, 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 and you got the lady next door, you know, the white lady next door who pays you, you know, once a month to clean the the garbage inside of the grass. Right. You know, you, you, you have a bunch of Irish and Jewish people still living there, maybe some Italians. But by the time 1976 comes, everything starts to change. Like they out, right? And um, the buildings, not so much there, but down the block. Now they're being bombed out, or I should say, burnt. Right. So now we start playing in abandoned buildings. You know, the rooftops are close enough so you can jump from one rooftop to the other in many areas. But um, it's just crazy because the the Bronx is burning. The Bronx is burning. You know, it's 1977, and we're freaking playing taps, and the lights go out, and all of a sudden, everyone, a few weeks after, becomes a DJ because they get they get equipment. Right. They stole the equipment from the stores because before that, they can't afford the equipment. They just have the one little um, radio amp that, that the church singers are using on right. Sunday. You know, yeah. So they grab that, and they use that during the week and put it out their window. <laughs> that, that's, the, that's, the, that's how you play the music, right? Yeah. But and then you do a pause button, pause button tapes. You know, so you put pause and rewind and pause and rewind and do your little pause button tape. And you use a fake DJ. But that neighborhood predominantly uh, uh, 161st, uh, 164 Sheridan, one block off the concourse. You can hear Yankee Stadium. So, so when the home run happens, you can hear it. You know, it's that close. I'm a big Yankee fan. I mean. Move to the damn Bronx. If you get a chance to be near Yankee Stadium, I go to 43 games in 1977. Obsessive. Wow. I'm there in 1976 when Chris Chambers hits the home run. But I'm, and I grabbed some grass and, and got home. And I said, I better throw this away before mom kills me if I come home. I don't know if I'm coming home late. You know, because it was a, a, a game. I went to the game to pay my dollar fifty to be out of the bleachers. Right. However, it was a nighttime game. So I went to the movie theater, the Earl movie theater, 161st, right there in Jerome Avenue River. And um, I watched the Chinese professionals. I watched it twice, too. So by the time it came out, it was dark. And then the game was on. So I ran. I have no money. But if you stand around and you little kid alone, someone will give you a ticket every once in a while, especially in the bleachers, $1.50. Right. So I went there. Jumped onto the field like everybody else. Ripped my pants because I was out in the bleachers. I had to jump, rip my pants, ripped and everything. Seeing people with, with, with um, seats and everything it was crazy. That was 1976. And then 77, everything changed. Wow. With the blackout, everything changed. That's when, that's when now, Eric, there's a jam over there. And a jam over there. And a jam over here. We didn't know who the, you know, we used to just go to the jams. And the jams, of course, was when the DJ plugged in the equipment to the street light and starts playing music. They put a little rope and some dudes there, make sure they don't steal the equipment. Sometimes they do steal the equipment and the party's over. Right. <laughs> you know, what happened? Rooks, cops would come all the time and turn it off. And sometimes it depends on the neighborhood to negotiate it. So, so, so that's what happened with an hour block. They put a crew together called the Unstoppable Crew, 1978. Even though they were still doing their stuff way before that. Right. DJ Louie Lou, the original DJ, DJ Louie Lou, um, and Teela Rock. Teela Rock had a famous song called It's Yours. He was the first artist on Def Jam before Def Jam was Def Jam. But we knew him as Karate T before that. Mm -hmm. He used to walk around with karate as well. So martial arts was always part of what would be the whole toughness or ghetto, right. you know, you had new trucks because you went to the abandoned building and got the chains from the window and then you went and stole the supers. <laughs> you stole the supers mop because they had a good stick. Uh, you made that, that would be stick go bad too, you know? Right, right. <laughs> because mom's skinny little mop wasn't working. That wasn't a good one, but the, but the stick go bad was a big heavy duty industrial mop or even the broom. But we, we, you know, so, so so instead of fighting, you know, we used to play fight all the time. 
you made me fight after that, but like all of a sudden in the schoolyard, yeah, yeah, people throwing kicks and punches. And, and then even when you're um when you're battling with somebody, you make them believe you're hitting them. That's what became like burning yeah. broken style or up blocking as they call it. But you're doing it just a make believe fight. Yeah. You, know? you remember that that jam Kung Fu fighting? Yeah. That was yeah. huge. Everybody go Kung Fu fight. Yeah, that was around the time Hong Kong Fu number one super guy, you know. <laughs> so those those things were part of our between the late sixties, mid sixties I should say, because I didn't get a chance to see the Green Hornet for some reason. Batman is what I saw. And I saw Cato in Batman when they made a cameo. Mm. The Green Hornet did that. And that dude was a whole other level. I said, what the heck is that? You know that it, it was embarrassing because now you he he's, he's doing all these crazy kicks. I'm saying the punches it wasn't working. Then I see the movie Five Fingers of Death, and then Bruce Lee came out with what would have been the big boss, which would be doing that Fist of Fury. That was it. Mm -hmm. I am hooked. Right, right. I am not going to be, I'm going to be a superhero. I'm going to be a, a martial artist, you know? And I went over to the, to the library, and I was looking for a martial arts book. I found one. I, to this very day, I make a fist like this in my right hand because of the influence of reading the book, and I had no idea that this was the case until I watched some of my students. And I said, why they have it like that? And said, they're the ones that were really visual and that were able to see explicit details that my fist was like that. And that comes from reading a book called Kyoko Shinkai, which is a style of martial arts that was invented by a Korean in Japan. So I don't know if it's a Korean style or Japanese style. They give him Japan the credit for it, but right. he called him Masuyama today. Yeah. What kind of, what kind of B boy were you? Locker, popper, right, rocker. So, okay, so 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 when you first start off, right, we dance is freestyle. It's not called whatever they called it afterwards, right? We were just dancing. And and you was doing the freak and you were doing whatever the hot dance, right? Even to the point where you're doing the twist as a little kid, you know. So you try to do what's hot. The first dance that I did that I knew that I was good at was the click clack. And the okay. click clack was like the mashed potato. And that wasn't an easy dance at all. Like right? you had to get your ankles together, you had to go this way and that way. Right. And that was like 1971, right? But and then the burning and things like that, I didn't see that until years after, because I'm only, remember, I'm, I'm 10 years old in, in 76. So I understand that starts out like in 73, 74. Right. And I'm not in Brooklyn. So that's not, I'm not seeing that. But I see the breaking in 76. That was so different because who the hell is the Florida dance like that? That's not, that's not, you could go into a split. Right. Because we saw James Brown doing that, Nicholas Brothers and, and people like that in movies. But, and, and in terms of footwork, you know, you had what would have been the hustle that they were doing, but we were doing the freak. But, but if you do a freestyle version of like the hustle, then you're doing what would be rocking because you, you, you're freestyling it. You know, and you're mimicking what you saw on Soul Train, right? So, and then they doing some stuff. So the mm -hmm. first time I, you see locking, that's Soul Train. You know, wow. like, what the hell is that? Well, and, but you, we don't do that because it looks a little too difficult. But we do the funky part because you really dance to get down with the girls. Like my whole thing wasn't just to dance to battle with somebody. I was like, well, I'm gonna dance. You know, I'm gonna be better than everybody. So like that, when the girl looks, I'm gonna talk to her. <laughs> that was my thing. That was my prize. Even to this very day is my prize. Make sure that my girlfriend, now my fiance, likes my dance. So I dance for her. You know? I wasn't dancing just with the dudes. Mm -hmm. To me, that didn't make any sense, personally. You know? Yeah. Plus, they make, yo, know, yo, when you dance with the dudes, it kind of sounds a little, a little funny, right? Even though, again, it was a war dance. So when you hear, so now everyone, that, that becomes time. Honey, you got to wait. We got to go back. Right. Da, 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 da. And there used to be multiple circles, you know, but whoever were the two good dancers, that, that, that circle would become bigger. Right. So if you go to the rocks, there's a circle here, circle here, circle here, circle here. But sometimes those circles become one if you're able to be the main person. Yeah, but it's also the art of war, you know. I, I, when I went to States, they always, again, dancing is dancing is dancing. So if you're a good dancer, you're going to attract attention in the club. There's always going to be a, a person that's known as the dancer in that club. And you got to always watch the corners. You got different corners of, of the club. They're usually run by the gangs or the drug dealers 
you know, but towards the middle are the dancers. So corner, 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 but here will be like the dancers. And if you come out and dance, I'm gonna come out and dance also. And I literally have battled a whole bunch of people and beat them off, and they all fighting against each other. Mm -hmm. And I go around them and I do a throw a bomb like a split. And the crowd goes, ooh, and then I'm out. <laughs> Once you throw a bomb, get out. There you go. And you never dance against women or kids. And if it's a little girl, uh, think about it. There was a time where voguing was hot and big. Mm -hmm. And the girls can get down with that thing. They can burn you, too. That's another <laughs> way to burn you, right? Right. So I would never dance against a girl because the girl's trying to go off on me. What I do, I took out the camera. I ain't afraid of the gun to him. So it, it's a whole strategy in the art of war. Right, right. Man, that just sounds so interesting. So what was the first club you ever went to? The first club that I can say that I was there more than one time was the Roxy, baby. <laughs> the Roxy. And that was the mecca of freaking what became hip-hop. I think so. I mean, there's no to, to this very day, there's never, there hasn't been a club that impactful because it was... Uh, a roller ring during the week, but that stage, I mean, that dance floor was huge. You know, you go to a club, you know, which would have been a tiny place, social club, whatever. Right. But here you got a stage, and then I was doing movies there. Of course, B Street was there. And um, man, I remember being in the back of the stage because I had juice. Mm -hmm. You know, I said, Us, we get inside for free. Time up the last dragon before the last dragon was a bouncer there. Even though he tried to get me to Bonds International. Yeah. For for everyone else who doesn't scared, understand man. us, what, yeah. what, what, what is us in yeah, the martial so, arts? So uh, uh, us has a lot of meaning to a lot of people, people, I should say. But in reality, it doesn't mean what most people think. So us shows courtesy and respect, and that's what Everyone's guiding us. So, so if you say us, someone says us. Oh, so. They say us. Oh, they already know you hear the martial artist. Even though you might be coming from kung fu, that doesn't say us. Chinese don't say that. But that's become like the code of being down the martial art. Us doesn't matter if you're white belt, yellow belt. If you say us, it's like you're official, you know. But in reality, that's not where it comes from. Masuyama, whose last, who, who reality, his name is um, Cho, forget his first name, Choi. The Japanese are very cautious. Right? They don't want to be brash. And he came up with a saying that went, Us! Because he battled his style versus everybody else's style, beat them. So it's more like in your face. Whoa! So that's what Us really means. Opposite of why everyone says Us, like you're cautious or you're showing respect. But it's the code to get into a club right now. Go to a club right now, you, you say Us in the front line, whoever watches, whoever looks at you, most likely a bouncer, he'll get you in. Awesome, awesome. I, I do remember that. And uh, could you break down, you, you were touching on a little about those, those early rockers and, and boogiers. What's the difference between a okay, first so, generation and a second generation? Okay, before? so when you say first generation, second generation, you also have to talk the region, right? So Brooklyn has its own history and they call themselves rockers. Okay. Now in the Bronx, there's a version of rockers, but their rockers are different. As an example, you got um, Frank, Frank Lopez, I believe I'm going back and forth. I hope, I hope I'm saying the right name, and Ema. They're the ones that were known as being the rockers, but the way they danced was more like Soul Train. Mm. You know, so they won all the dance contests in, ah, the, in the clubs. Frank Rojas. Rojas. Sorry, Frank. You know what? He, <laughs> it's crazy because Frank's, Frank's son was one of my students, too. Okay. He, he told me Frank Rojas. So Frank and Ema, right? Ema was supposed to be the one that taught Frank. And, and, but bottom line is that these two guys were rocking, but they were dancing more like Soul Train, right? So they, they'll, listen, they'll dance to the same music, but it's more like a groove. Where in Brooklyn, it was more aggressive, where they were slamming each other. It was more like what would have been done, I believe, first generation um, Black Spades, the gangs. Because they were doing a dance that would be rocking too. Right. And that rocking is closer to what Brooklyn was doing. Burning. So, yeah, which is, again, the ultimately you want to burn somebody, take them out. So we called it, when I first heard it, I didn't hear rock, I heard burn. Right. Yo, he burned you, kid. 
what? And, and my cousin was saying how he was gonna dance and burn me. So that's the difference. When we learned it, so called up rock, it was one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, right. two, three, one, two, one, two, three. So those first generation guys had they no flow work. Yeah, they, 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 the, the top rock, I'm talking about, this is strictly top rocking because, they, because it's supposed to be up rocking. Our, the Bronx version of up rocking that Crazy Legs, the rock steady did, the New York City Breakers did, that you see in B Street, is one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, three. One, two, one, two, three. We didn't do one and we're stay, staying up and just like the way they rock is completely a different flow. It's to the same music, same premise where you're fighting against each other, but a completely different flow. I'm talking about strictly rocking. So let's mm -hmm. say rocking is, 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 is on top, right? So let's just say that's the first generation, or I should say the first dance, rocking. But then you had. In California, you had locking. So say we had rocking over here, up rocking. You had locking over there. The boogie years. Well, that's not even boogie yet. Okay. That's locking. Locking is, is, is Campbell lockers. And the Campbell lockers, are, are the most famous of them were Shabadoo, who really comes from Chicago, rest in peace. Puerto Rican from Chicago that relocates to California. And, and the Campbell lockers became the, 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 the LA lockers, I believe. And, and they were on Soul Train with the big Apple hats, right? They were so. Now we talking about this is around the same time. This, right. is, early, this is early, early and mid seventies. Of course, when you do it, people say that's rerun. No, that's because he came afterwards. He was really known as Penguin as part of the. That was L.A. So, Rockers, and then Lockers. Now you got Breakers. That's that, that comes even before what would be the Poppers. Or what's considered the electric boogaloos. Got it, got it. They were electric, and that's from Oakland, California. And that's Boogaloo Sam, Pop and Pete. They actually had styles. They had the penguin style. You know, you had what was considered popping. But they got the guys to, you know, so 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 they had like like five, six, seven styles amongst boogalooing. And Boogaloo was like, when you got keep on trucking, ever seen the picture, keep on trucking? No. Yeah. That, that, remember that? It, it was a photo that a guy with long legs, and he was, it was just say, he just say, keep on trucking. It was a cartoon. Bottom line is that it was part of a move. So when you would move, you would, you would open the leg really wide. And kind of like the Zoot Suits guys. They used to walk with the Zoot Suit. And, right. and that so California flavor has two different styles. That's locking and popping. But you're not supposed to call it together because locking is one thing. Popping comes from Boogaloo, but popping is the style of Boogaloo that became the most popular from Poppin' Pete, who supposedly invented that. Right. Okay. You know, even though his old, older brother, Boogaloo Sam, is the one that started. Now, over here, we had up rocking and breaking. Now, what made the world go crazy wasn't the locking, wasn't the popping, wasn't the up rocking. It was the breaking, the B-boys. They're the ones that made the world go nuts. And that's why, because of the spinning on the head, the gymnastics moves, and so on and so forth, the dynamic of it. And that is New York City. When you hear guys that they say that they were rocking, or they're the first B-boys, or they actually say break dancers, they weren't really breaking. If you look at them, right? it's like, when well, you think you hit the ground, they used to call it, they used to call it go off, Going off, or the boing. Boying is another version of it too, right. which is really just freestyle dancing. Now, somewhere in between there, we went into the wearable, but we're, we're not going to talk about that. But that, that's like how house, you know, house music even that's was a different influence. project. Yeah, it's a different. <laughs> but but again, very influential too because that, that that crossed over from what would have been house music, but our version of house music because we wasn't in, in the Paradise Garage or so we were a little younger and we still listened to the club music and you know and then, and that's when when it goes from. When, when the Roxy becomes 1018, then I would go to the freestyle world. You know, so, right. and, and, and a lot of those were like Tony, Tony from TK, the group TK were, were, were rappers. And they did one song, and then they just had to go that route because they didn't want the so called Puerto Ricans weren't allowed to be like MCs, which is a whole other nonsense that ended up happening. Where even though we were apart from the beginning, right, right. we had to become singers. But anyway, so, so the breakers in New York City. 
were the ones who made the world go crazy over this thing. Of course, then you add to the culture, and this happened in 1981 when they went on the Wild Style Tour. See, no one gets the chance to see this crazy stuff until a documentary called Wild Style happens. But the documentary is about graffiti. Wild Style is a style of graffiti that I believe was created by Phase 2. Rest in peace, to Phase 2. And that's what the movie's premise was about, even though they changed things around. And that's when they had a chance, for the first time, the rest of the world had a chance to see graffiti, emceeing, or DJing, emceeing, and those dancers. That, that, that was that's a foundational right. film. That was the, and then there was another one not too long, around the same time, called Style Wars. And again, that was about graffiti, and you had all the four elements of the culture that were there, too. You know, and that, that's when the rest of the world started saying, oh, okay, there's this thing happening in the Bronx, and blah, blah, blah. Even though it was happening in Manhattan, too, mm -hmm. in Brooklyn, even in Queens, and even Staten Island, the Force MCs, or the Force MDs, you know, great rappers, too. Can, can you talk to us about your early and first mentors in breaking? Oh, okay, so... For me, again, Prince Thunder Rock was just it. I, <coughs> I don't get into that breaking because of my martial arts. I'm more into the martial arts. When I break, I do sweeps like the Kung Fu movies, which was part of a breaking move. Right. Forward and back. But I could do a split, and you can't do a split. So that's one of my power moves. I don't do a lot of that, but it's enough for the girls to see it. But what, what, what I do is around 79, 80, I do this thing called the backslide. The backslide becomes the moonwalk. But it's called the backslide. And all of a sudden, people start miming. You know, we miming. So, since I'm taller, up rocking, and boogie, electric boogie as we know it, is where I lean more towards. When I do hit the floor, it's limited, but I do the split. I do, if we're up rocking, I'm throwing kicks. I'm jumping over you like a wave when you do the, when you do the move and you come down, right. right? So it starts to gel into a whole bunch of stuff. More in the early 80s. Remember, I'm 10 and 76. How many clubs am I going to? I ain't going to no clubs. I'm just dancing in the area. So there's not a lot of parties per se. Right. You're doing the, the, um, one one blank. You slow dancing away then forever. You know you're trying to get get yeah. with, you're trying to get with the girls. But but now my preteen to teen that changes. Now you go to some parties more often. And when you're dancing there, so I'm talking about 81, 82, that's when I'm doing what would be the electric boogie. So my teacher during that time, first guy I ever seen do that was a guy named Jr. Which I don't know where he taught me the backslide. And I, and, and I and I wasted the back. My sneakers got wasted because I was rubbing it too hard on the floor. Right. But then I met a guy named Mike, Magic Mike. Oh, man. And Mike was doing some stuff that was just like, what the hell? He was doing some some something that years after looked like an electric boogaloo. We learned that as electric boogie. Right. They were doing the boogaloo, and the difference is that they were dancing to funk. We were dancing to what would have been today known as break beats, faster beats. So I stuff was dun, 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 you know, rock, rock. Once Planet Rock came out, oh, forget about it. Right. That's that's when we started look, the electro music combined. But those guys were dancing to again funk. So they would think they, you know, they think oh, oh, yeah, they, they were doing jungle boogie, you know. Right. We wasn't doing that. We were rock, rock, planet rock. Stop, right? We were doing different types of our stuff was a lot faster than them. We called it electric boogie. They called it they were the electric boogaloos. The electric boogaloos come out in, in, again, Soul Train. And when the electric boogaloos come out in Soul Train, we get a chance to see some of it, but our music's different. We don't really like that funk. I don't like that funk mm -hmm. until years after when I do like the funk. So, 81, 82, 82, I'm practicing like the Kung Fu movie in, in the house. And Mike is my teacher. Magic Mike. Magic Mike teaches clown. Clown with a K, one of the baddest dancers of all time. 
were classmates or would be trained by the same person. And then there was a guy named Fame Jackson who took second place in, in the Swatch Watch contest behind Mr. Freeze. You know, he was taught by Mike and Mr. Pop. And then there was a kid named Summer Pop that used to go battle everybody. 81, 82, 83, Summer Pop, Son of Pop is battling everybody. And they would kid magic. And so that's what would happen too. Someone would teach you, and then you become son of or kid. You know, so there was a little, there was, yeah, a little version. Yeah, my little, my, 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 my little spike. Right. You know, Fonzie, spike. You know? Right. <laughs> so, that, and that's how we were taught. If someone was a year or two older than you, they became your teacher, your mentor, your man. And, and if you're older, and that's, yo, that's my boy, leave him alone. You know? So it was back to, to being down with somebody, and you have these alter ego names in order to be part of what would be the the Justice League or the X Men or, or, or the Avengers. Right, right. Yeah, that's what the crews really are. Cool. Could, could you tell me, in your own words, B Boy, the B in B Boy? What does it mean? Where does it come from? When I first heard the word B Boy, that's another thing too. You were the breaker. They were breaking, so you're a B Boy. You're breaking. But and then I also heard, in my case, yeah, we're B-boys too. We're boogie boys, right? And we're all from the Bronx. We're Bronx boys too. When you're from Brooklyn, you don't call yourself a B-boy initially. When you hear B-boy, you're from the Bronx. Bronx boy, break boy, boogie boy. So it's become, of course, a whole bunch of other stuff, but that's, that's it. It was a breaker. You was breaking. Right. And it wasn't... Breaking ING is breaking IN. So everything had to be hip hop. Had to shorten out. Breaking. Yeah, yeah. Shorten the words. In, in, in your own words, as a martial artist, what influence did the martial arts have on B Boy? It was it's freaking huge. No, no, no one can deny it. You know, everyone wanted to be Bruce Lee. And, and they would go see the Kung Fu movie in 42nd Street and see the sweeps and the swipes and the. I mean, especially. <coughs> I, I'm biased because if you look at my solos back in 1991, which is not long for breaking, it's 10 years after Wild Style, but it's still the longest run of what breaking has stayed because it was dead before 91. Here in America, there's no more breaking after 1985. It's dead. It's played out. But actually, it was played out before that in the Bronx. It was played out already by 1979. Um... Prince Thunder Rock's not break in 1980. He stopped from 76 to 79. But we went to Queens, USA Skating Rink, and they were breaking over there. I came back and told Thunder Rock, yo, they're breaking over there. He's like, ah, oh, man, that's played out. There was a group called the Dynamic Rockers over there. And the Inferno Crew, when I took, I used to go to Queens all the time because my, my, my family was there. And they were the ones that kept it going when it was played out of the box. Got it. Then the, yeah. And then the Rocksteady crew, when they got with them and they battled, and it became a famous battle in Lincoln Center, and that brought it. But by the time 81 comes in these documentaries, the guys who were breaking first, I, I didn't see Spy in them. You know, I, I didn't see a lot of the first generation. Yeah, like the first, the first generation. And that's another thing too. It gets a little touchy because when we say first generation, and they're breaking like that. The previous generation tries to get credit as being the ones that taught them that. But in reality, if you look at it, it's not the same dance. Yes, one could have, you know, gelled into the other, which is true. But when you got guys that say, yeah, I invented that, that's not true because those moves weren't even thought of. And how do I know? Because I didn't see, you didn't see it in B Street. You know, you didn't see, like, like the moves they're doing today, the five-year-old kid from freaking Russia or China that's doing moves that they couldn't fathom in B Street at all. Right. With the flavor, too, and the attitude. So it's not like they faking it no more. That, 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 that spirit has gone worldwide, you know? But, again, 81, breaking, 91, different breaking. There was a gap in between, you know, chronologically. It's empty for a while. I digress. What was the question? <laughs> well, uh, we we were uh, 
you were talking about the the Lincoln Center and, and the dying off of, of breaking and yeah, coming back. Right. So that so so by the time breaking became big in those documentaries and the movies, most of the original people were doing it. The first generation, as he said. But what I was trying to reference also was that there was a first generation that like how long does it last? How long does is it four years? Is, right, it, is right. it five years? You know, like so when people get, there's an overlap. Yeah, so so it, it gets a little funny. Like as an example, if I say to you, "Oh man, that guy was a legend." Well, how long was he dancing for? Was it four years? Was it five years? How long do you have to dance to be a legend? Oh, he's a pioneer. Another. Well, how long do you have to dance to be a pioneer? No one actually made that into it. It's just a matter of someone's opinion. Right. You're a legend. Okay. When they say that to me, martial arts or, or even dance, they go, I used to drive a legend that I know, you know, actor had a legend I drove it. So, so, but yeah, Dynamic Rockers, Rocksteady Crew, and then a bunch of crews after that were the ones that kept it going, but it wasn't, I saw it die. In my neighborhood, it was dead. 1979 is done. 80? Crazy Legs talks about that a lot. 79 and dying off. Yeah, well, it, 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 because it's true. Now, he goes on a mission, so on and so forth. A bunch of people on the mission. Legs, listen, you got to give Crazy Legs credit because realistically, the Rocksteady crew, where that, people don't want to hear this, and I understand. I don't have a dog in the race, even though I ended up becoming part of Rocksteady. And incredible breakers, and if uh, and a new New York City breaker will call me that too, you know, because that's who I am, part of the culture. However, the Rock City crew specifically were the ones that went worldwide because of the movie Wild Style, and they went on that tour along with Africa Bambara, the Soul Sonic Force, and, 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 and Africa Islam, and, and, and even the Double Dutch girls. Girls that were playing Double Dutch were part of the culture. They, were, they actually went on tour, too. Imagine that. Right. So it was a cultural tour that had all the above, from the graffiti to the rapping to the DJ to the dancer and to the Double Dutch, like I said. So they became the most famous internationally. Yes, you also had people that went out there at different times but not in the impact of, of, of the rock study. Now, here, I didn't see too many rock study because they were on tour. So I was watching what was considered the dynamic, not the rockers, they splintered off to the dynamic breakers. Right. And the dynamic breakers were, were, were managed by Danny Corey and also rest in peace and, and, and um, Loretta Rock, which was time of the last dragon's mother. And, and they went on the Fresh Fest tour. That's 1984, 85. So they want Fresh Fresh Tour number two, which is 1985. Right. That's when Def Jam, Russell Simmons, and, and you know they got um, Run DMC as the main one, and the Fat Boys, and, and they also had Grandmaster Flash and Furious Five. But they had the Dynamic Breakers on there. The difference between the Breakers and the Rockers was that they took the Breakers from the Rockers. It was just a handful of people, and they also started the Dynamic Dolls. Right. And the Dynamic Dolls, which which the most famous one here after happens to be Brenda K. Starr, who sings not just freestyle, and she became a big Saifera also, too. Right, right. And that comes from the name from them. And Kim Akasi. Yeah, she's been around forever to the very day. She's part of the, you know, yeah. But again, Brenda became an international singing star. Right. As a matter of fact, um, she's the one that introduced Mariah Carey to time we told her, and she and, and Mariah, Mariah did backup singing for her song, her biggest song ever that crossed over the top. You know, but again, that all comes from that whole energy that came from the the nineteen mid eighties. Mid eighties, a lot of energy came out in the movie The Last Dragon. There's a scene in the club, man. The breakers that were there, B Boy London, that's down from the rock stuff. Excuse me, not rock study, uh, 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 New York City breakers, Tiny. Tiny from Tiny's the guy that in the movie Beach Street, he's the one that does the swipe into the 1990 spin. That wasn't Lee. Lee couldn't do that. You could tell Lee could barely break. You know, right. he was more of a boogie boy, from what I understand. You know, but you know, so there's so many talented people, but they didn't know how to put together what would be marketing or packaging. So so artists are always gonna be like that. 
you know, it doesn't matter if you're a singer, a dancer, you don't you don't think about the money, you're just expressing yourself. Mm -hmm. You're just an artist. Then somebody comes along and, 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 and schools you. That's why to this very day, you know, I, I, I'm embarrassed that I wasn't here a half hour earlier because Crazy Legs would be here a half hour earlier. Crazy Legs would be here a half hour earlier. When when I was about 10 minutes late because of, and I had a reason about communicating with you, well, he wouldn't have an excuse. He would have been here a half hour earlier. So maybe he only, only would have been 20 minutes earlier when the average person doesn't even show up in the same hour. Right. You're waiting for a half hour, an hour to do an interview like this because these artists have no idea how to keep some type of timeline. Right. It's not even personal. So it, it's important to have a mentor, right? A teacher, like I said, you got a younger guy, you got an older guy, but... In the case with the Rocksteady crew, they had a manager called Cool Lady Blue. And that lady taught them how to do certain things. And one of the things that I learned from Lex, I was completely blown away and shocked, and this is a big thumbs up. And, and, and if Lex is going to be at a meeting, he's there a half hour early, and he's prepared. That's the reason why Rocksteady beat out other crews. They got their early and we're prepared because most people get there late. To this very day, Lex has that habit, and I gotta respect him for that and a whole bunch of other things. But in terms of Rocksteady, the Rocksteady crew is the number one crew of all time, period. Whether they might have been the best or not, it doesn't matter. To me, the well, fact of the matter is, the fact of the matter is that there would not be any other stuff. Even to the point where in 1991, when I got him to bring Rocksteady back, and he went to Europe, they thought they saw the second coming of Christ. The rumor was that he was dead. The Europeans didn't stop. See, there's a timeline, right? So we do things here in the Bronx. It might hit Brooklyn, you know, it hits Manhattan, and then hit Brooklyn, and then I don't know if it, it eventually gets to Jersey, and maybe, maybe it works its way down to the south. So they're doing one of our dances from like last year, you know? Mm -hmm. Well, it goes across the Atlantic Ocean, too. But remember, they saw the breaking with rock steady. So the Europeans still think that the culture is happening over here. So they take a trip over here, and it's not happening. They only see the breakers downtown making money, with Clown being one of the you know, main ones, and they have a whole crew, the street, the street dancers now. The street dancers are the ones that never stop. They were, because when people come to New York to see the New York culture, they see them. The subways, Washington Square. Yeah, well, well, pretty much Times Square was the main spot, right? That's the main spot. But yes, they go subways and so on and so forth also. But the main spot was Times Square, the middle of the world. And that was Float Master John, Float Committee, and the Breeze team, you know, and, 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 and they had pretty much it was a bunch of people that went through there from little kids, you know, and, and these guys, some of the baddest breakers of all time, and they weren't even on beat. Like, their dancing was different. It was like they were dancing to the, to the drum, and they were just performing for the crowd. So they wasn't really bad at it. They were performing for the crowd, but they became some of the – K-Mel was one of them. Like, a little kid, K-Mel, him, him and Chilly Willie were the two little, little kids that were dancing with, with Clown and the rest of them, and they even got Clown – they, they, they put some money together to put Chili Williams into my karate school to be able to um, get some self-discipline and focus. Plus, he got more flexible now, so his solos, he had the splits, you know? But, um, and I had Smirk. I, a lot of martial artists, I should say, a lot, a, a lot of the hip-hop heads became students of mine because I had eventually six schools, you know, throughout the city. So, but but, but my, my, my demo team, um, all my students were taught as part of their training. One, two, one, two, three. One, two, one. There's a leg workout and a half. You're squatting. You switch shifting legs. That's why when you saw me warming up in that video, I'm doing martial arts. But as a dancer, I'm throwing kicks here because I know that you can pull a muscle and I'm going to warm it up because I'm out of shape. Doing, you know. But it's still the same thing. It's about the battle. Okay? That's another tool. Hip-hop. Breaking especially, it's about the battle. Without the battle, the MC battle, the DJ battle, even the graph battle, everything is about 
burning somebody or taking them out. But it's internal. Because a lot of times, before you get into that circle, oh, I'm scared. People used to have that whole, some of the best dancers never got into the circle. Choked. Oh, wow, wow. Now, 1981 Lincoln Center, were you there? No? I see a portion of it. I'm not there personally. I'm doing more shorts. Got it, got it. It's 1981. And I like the martial arts more than I dancing because the martial arts comes before the dancing. So when I go to the Roxy, I get there, I go there during the off season of karate, which is the summertime or the heart of the winter. At this point, by, by the time I go there, more like 82, 82, I'm 15 years old. 1982, I'm 15 years old. Actually, well, I'm 16 years old. 82, I'm 16. So 15, 16, you're not supposed to be in the club. Right. How'd you get in? How'd you get in? Martial arts, us. <laughs> That's right. So that got me in. A lot of the bouncers were martial arts. And that's how, and I, and I had a reputation that preceded me. At age, at age 16, I started fighting black boat men already, 1982, and I started winning. By 1983, I'm already rated as one of the top 10 fighters in New York, New Jersey, regional level. So that became my vocation because in 80, 82, I found out I was going to be a father and I was in 83. So what would have been my dancing years became daddy years. So now I'm going to karate tournaments, not so much in New York City, but out of state to make some money in the weekend because I only get paid three thirty five an hour. Mm. As I'm getting paid three thirty five an hour, you know, over at Central in Jamaica, Queens, on Parsons Boulevard, with Fat Cat and Supreme Team and all these guys are selling crazy drugs over there in the Basley Project, I'm the guy that runs and gets their lender suits, their, lender, their, their dealer suits. Mm -hmm. And so on and so forth. While the salesperson does the call, I'm the kid running around getting them the the sneakers and everything else. But it takes me an hour an hour and a half to get home. Right. So if I can go to a tournament that went the way I can win a hundred dollars, that's like a week's salary bonus. Kicking somebody, man, I was doing that all the time. And if you get five hundred, like I had a few times, that's like a month's salary. Wow, bonus. Back in '83. Eighty-four. Were you at Fresh Fest '85? Yeah. Talk to us about your memory there. So 1985 was... Fresh Fest, I was at what would have been Nassau Coliseum. What was interesting there, the people be again. I'm backstage. Got juice. I'm backstage. The people who didn't perform at the time were, I think, the best of that era, that year. You know, was Dougie Fresh and the Guest Fresh crew. Him and Slick Rick, Lottie Dottie. When Lottie Dottie came out, it just changed everything. We like to party. Oh my God. And, and, and Slick Rick just, it was it was a perfect combination. They were in the backstage. I remember complaining about, you know, it was the Def Jam tour. So these guys were on Def Jam, so they couldn't be on tour with them, you know. They, 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 or, or they weren't part of Rush management. But it ended with Run DMC. Right before that, it was the Fat Boys. Right before that, it was Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five. And and then I believe in between there somehow was Houdini, mm -hmm. you know? And then um, I don't think I, I was on that one, but years after he had his own tour. Um, but when I saw the Dynamic Breakers, the one in particular that I loved, and again, I'm biased, guys, because he's a martial artist, his name was Sir Styles. Felix Cortez. He was doing windmills with sticks, his Filipino sticks. You know, it was just freaking awesome. You know, what the, what the dynamic break in the hat was like a five ring, four ring circus. So you had um, Gano and I'm not even going to mention their names, but, but you had them doing four different things. So they were spinning. That's another thing too. Like when we saw that spinning thing on the head, right. on the chest, we, didn't, we never did that. That was just dynamic. I don't know if that's part of hip hop. Right. It's impressive, but I ain't never seen any other crew do that. Just they, like showmanship. Yeah. Enter they, entertainment. We understand, like, I never saw, did, did you? Never. I, I, I'm just, for what it was worth, no disrespect intended because it's kind of cool, but whether it was the guys or the girls doing that, it was only dynamic that ever did that. Both rockers, I believe, and then breakers, maybe. 
Yeah, when they started doing routines, sometimes they went outside the yeah. B boy. Yeah, but right, right, but not not rock steady. Not rock steady. Rock steady always kept it more pure. And what I mean by pure uh -huh. is this: footwork was raw, pure. Yes, they had the foundation of what would be like. Like I'm saying, we see Lex do footwork. He's gonna take these guys out. I don't give a damn what they say. In terms of, because they have that first generation B boy, you know. His power moves are going to be dope. His free is going to be dope. Now, these guys, but, but now he's going to be limited to the amount of power moves he's going to do. These guys' footwork was pretty whack, but their power moves were phenomenal. Just to be fair, what went, what made it to the Olympics is the power moves. If he would have just been doing footwork, right. as dope as it was, to the beat and everything else, they wouldn't be going over to what would be a sport. Right. You know, but again... I'm from the Bronx. I'm also looking at this from 76. When I see some of these people do some, even the top rock, I'm like, that don't look right. That's not flavor. You know, the girls didn't look right a lot of time. You know, when I looked at the dynamic dolls, they were like, it was like, it was cute, but they weren't like the girls today. Now, breaking is at an all time best ever. Holy crap. Just footwork battles. They've done footwork to levels that I never saw. The top rocking part, no one can ever say, but it was the freaking, not Americans. It wasn't the Americans, man. What kept breaking going was the Europeans and then the Japanese. Of course, Koreans and Chinese after. But the Japanese, they came with Rocksteady tattooed on them. <laughs> when Rocksteady had a section over there, couldn't believe it. That's their commitment because they they get they were they were obsessive. They were fans, right? And and when they came to New York, it wasn't happening. They, were like, oh, they came to the Bronx in the early nineties, and then and they, they were disappointed. And then they started. I shouldn't say that. If they came in the eighties, late eighties, they would have been disappointed. It was that only Manhattan, right? Nineties, ninety one, ninety two, ninety three. It was because of me and Rockstar. Talk to me about that. How did it? What happens is I go to a club. Now it's called Nels. And Nels is not playing no rap because it became gangster rap. They freaking messed it up. Now it's gangster rap. I don't want to hear that in the clubs. So I go to this DJ, the Duke of Denmark, and Nels was the spot. That's what they did. I love it when they call me Big Pop, but the big old school bar. That's right. where the video was made. That's, that's Nels, 14th Street. Seven and eight, and uh, to get in there, you gotta have juice. I got juice, us, man, right? <laughs> but they doing house music. I mean, like house music, like that was where you know house, house the garage and house music to me were, were, they were like homosexual dance. You mm -hmm. know, not that they were the only ones that were there, but it was really like I don't know. I, I didn't like house music because I didn't like, it. and they were dancing like salsa wrong to me. You know. It, you know but, I, but that's the hot spot. And they used to play reggae. I didn't like that either. Man, I wish I could dance the way I want to dance. But they're not playing the music. So I said, Duke, I know you can't play no hip hop. You can play some Mardi Gras, some Mexican, some James Brown, some. And one day I'm upstairs eating a nails. He had two, two, two floors of dancing. And I hear. Boom. And I'm with legs. It's me, me, crazy legs, and the last dragon. Time up. I went downstairs. I, I hit medicine legs, and we started up rocking. All of a sudden, those house dancers, rest in peace, Voodoo Ray, Peter Paul, Pee Wee, they started up rocking too. I was like, "What the hell? I knew it. I knew. Why well, you guys are dancing this thing? That was a new hot thing. I had to wear cowboy boots, and, and house music was the freaking way to do it. Then all of a sudden." Things started to change. Now in the club, they started playing some of the original beats. See, it wasn't rap music. It was the original funk, break beats. James Brown, etc. Right. So I said legs. Rock City in the 90s. It took me six months to convince them. And he said, all right. I said, wait a minute. How? I asked him, why did you start breaking? Or why did we start breaking to have fun, right? And the girls, right? 
why we stop? Oh, because they told us like that we were playing out, but they were copying all our stuff. And don't you see, at the time of, they had <laughs> um, Paul Abdul up rocking and dancing with a freaking dog. It's an animated dog that was really Boogaloo Shrimp from the movie Breaking. Right. Which, by the way, the movie Breaking is, has nothing to do with Breaking. See, break, break, breaking became the synonymous to break dance. Break dance, electric boogie, break dance, electric boogie. Cool lady blue, and one day she says, yes, that's break dance, you know. What are they doing? They're doing the break dance. Because they were dancing, we called it breaking. She called it the break dance in an interview, and they started calling it break dancing. Wow. That's what happened, cool lady blue. Again, back to rock study. Okay. So, um, and for what I was worth, just for historical purposes, the floor masters uh -huh. were considered um, like the little crew that was dancing against Rocksteady, but it was not a makeshift, but a setup, you know, when they did it every weekend. It was part of a show. Right. And, and um, the grill and, and, and other clubs like that, because Cool Lady Blue was showcasing this. And that crew split it up to the New York City Breakers eventually, and the Incredible Breakers. That's Brian and, and Chino, two brothers. The, the, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. the Raya brothers, they um, they became part of the Incredible Breakers, uh, started in break, Incredible Breakers, which I think, of. Yeah. incredible. All, all these people were incredible. All of them were dynamic, all of them rock steady, and all of them were New York City Breakers. What was the first year you got down with rock steady? 1991. That was the last, that's when rock steady came back together. We did a show for the Source magazine. You know, the source used to be a table like this back in, in, in you know, back in the day. So the source magazine, we went right after Carrots One, Video Music Box had it, and that's it. It made it official. You know, because um, and my solo was flips, kicks, and splits. But I was on beat with the as long as I'm on beat with the, the crew, right? Then I can go into my solo with martial arts and its original style and flavor. That to this very day, that's become an inspiration to what would be all the kicks and flips and stuff you do in martial and, and, and breaking up. Right, right. If someone wants to challenge me on that, they can. But before that, no one's kicking and splitting. And, you know, they, they can't do that. They're not, they're not high level martial artists. Were you in any videos or movies with yeah. Rocksteady? Talk to us yeah, about so, that. Yeah, so there's a video that, of course, that video of, of us performing in Video Music Box, you know, that was. Pretty big. Video music back was huge for us in New York City. So that's out. But we also did a show one time where I had New York versus New Jersey in karate, and I had the last dragon on my team. But before we fought, I said, hey, how about we bring, you know, let us do our routine? So me, Legs, and Mr. Wiggles did our dance routine that we did for the Source magazine a few weeks before that. That's on video, too. Right? That came out in Martial Arts World, which was our MSG network. But there's a music video called Perum Perum Pink, which originally was called Fingertips, which is for a group called ESP in 1991 also. That's when Legs, Wiggles, Fables, Quick Step, and Fast Feet, meaning me, come out dancing, doing the same routines, up rock routines and stuff like that in the music video. That music video is not even spoken about because it wasn't a big group, but it still came out in video, video music boxes and so on and so forth. And that was the return of that quality level of dancing to music videos, as far as I go. Even though years after, they give, give Chief Rocker and other songs credit. And that was, um, um, you know, when we did the show um, for The Source, I have to dance. Mm -hmm. I'm the newest member. Now, Quick Step is down. But he was part of Rhythm Technicians, which Wiggles was down, down with that too. And he was still dancing in the streets. So he was very active, phenomenal dancer. Okay. I'm a martial artist. I have to dance with Crazy Legs, Ken Swift, Mr. Wiggles, and Quick Step. I got to make sure I'm not that dude going to the left when they go to the right. <laughs> yeah, I, I, can't, I can't be that dude. <laughs> Let's shock me, he says. He want me down because he respected my dancing. I could break good enough to be down with, but I break, I lock, I boogie, I up rock, and I do it with my own style and flavor. 
which is what you're supposed to be if you're part of a crew, not a mimic of the same thing, not five of the same. That's why, listen, guys, you're going to get mad at me again, but I don't care. When I see Beach Street, I say Rocksteady wins because everybody did something different. When I see New York City Breakers, as great as they are, no doubt about it, I think the best one is, is uh, Powerful Pexta and, and also Flip Rock, but that's a matter of opinion. But they all did windmills. Like, that was a move that everybody did. So I used to get tired of that same freaking walk that we're going down a little bit, but he just did a windmill. And then he did it on, I did it a higher with no hand. Okay, maybe that's the case. So I wasn't, and, don't, and I never appreciated those moves done by everybody in the crew. Yes, it is the power move that became the precursor to what happens today, but it was redundant to me. Like, come on, man. So when I see Legs do it, he does it from the stomach, different, and, and something as simple as doing that freaking move and taking off the sneakers was, was boom. You know, that was, that was just a bomb to me. Got it, got it. You talk about any... Were there any DJs down with Rocksteady when you were with them? Talk to us about how they contributed. The, guy, the Rocksteady crew had the best DJ in the world at the time, which was known as, before that, the Incredible Scratch Pickles. These guys were from California. DJ Kubert, Mix Master Mike and Apollo. They won the DMC, which is the biggest DJ scratching competition in the world when they had three DJs at one time. They pretty much outlawed them, so they became judges the next year because they won the world championship. Normally one DJ wins, and, but Cuba won himself alone and, 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 and not the original Mixed Master Mike, but Mike became the DJ for, of all people, the, um, the Beastie Boys. But the thing that Rocksteady did that had DJ Scribbles, that was part of this group called the Young Black Teenagers, mm -hmm. which were white guys, which was, that's another story. They started, Rocksteady wasn't about Rocksteady alone. That's where people got it. No. When we came back, or I should say when they came back and I was part of it, I was telling Lex that we have, it's a culture thing. It wasn't one thing. Everybody got kicked to the damn crib. It wasn't just Rock Steady. It was, it was the whole culture. So we did a show in the Palladium. And that day, you had Mr. Wiggles, Crazy Legs, Fast Feet, Kit Freeze. That's Dynamic Rockets. And Powerful Peck stuff. That's New York City Breakers. Or dancing on stage together. Sacrilegious during that time, if you would think, right? I mean, he can't do that. Right. And then they did a tour called, um, a show called Jam on the Groove. And they picked up dances every time they would go to a city, they picked up dances from that region. That was started by Rocksteady and Rhythm Technicians, which is Mr. Wiggles and, and Crazy Lex. And um, nobody could deny that. So it wasn't just about Rocksteady when Rocksteady came back out the third time. It opened up doors for everybody who was freaking breaking and they exposed it to the entire world. Right. That's the truth. Awesome, awesome. How about any MCs, you know, when, when, of when course. they came back? Talk so, to us about them. Well, Rocksteady first and foremost was not just a wake set of breakers. They had DJs. They had, so, so, so I mentioned the DJs. The MCs, I'm going to give credit. I'm biased. The Nomads, or which also had Q Unique, the Rocksteady Rhymer, as they call it. And Q Unique has done probably 10 albums throughout the years. Big, big following in Europe. And um, he was part of a group, a group called the Arsonists. The Arsonists were the hottest, no pun intended, they were the hottest freaking underground, remember, rap music went from pop rap music to underground, the hardcore underground. That was a, that was a whole other world. So they were more known there. Main one being Q, Anthony Kiles, Q Unique, and the Nomads with my brother, MC Beretta, and also 
the awesomeness with a whole bunch of incredible, you know, that, that, that just was, legs would know more because it got, it got to the point where, listen, by the time 1994 goes, 94, I'm not really part, I'm not doing any shows or anything like that. I'm opening up karate schools. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, my school is on Broadway, which is 55th, 54th Street, right across from, from the Ed Sullivan Theater and, and what would be Broadway dance. So I'm in the middle of the world. I'm a businessman. And I'm making six figures, and I just want to make sure I'm not so rock steady. Or at the time, it's not just rock steady, but they're paying me to rent my place to uh, to practice. And people from all over the freaking world, Mr. Freeze included, you know, he 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 put some. Um, he has a whole bunch of videos, and you see the fonts and his karate logo on the wall. So my school was like like the Shaolin Temple for for breaking or dancing <laughs> in general. And it was. It's just the truth. And my whole like that, too. Got it, got it. In, in, into your martial arts career, you said that you had uh, several episodes on BronxNet. I did 24 episodes on BronxNet where I interviewed Crazy Legs and the last dragging a whole bunch of people. So I, I guess then it might be not a reality show, but one day I got tired of being on the set. I said, wait a minute, this is my show, right? We out of here. And we went on location to my karate school and I started interviewing people. Um, it wasn't a handicap, but we may believe it was a handicap if we were walking with it. Yeah, so I did 24 episodes of that. And um, it was to educate people on, see, karate is cool, and then it gets corny real quick. And then that word, us, things like that. I like, no, I think, what is that? What's that sound? You know, it's, it's, it's weird. I come from Taekwondo. We never said that. We said, we said Taekwondo. We didn't say anything. So I had to make karate cool. So that's why I had to teach my kids how to dance. By the time they became teenagers, I had to teach them how to be entrepreneurs. So I said, listen, you're 15. You want those sneakers that your mother, you know, when she buys them, she can't buy any shoes. She probably haven't, haven't bought shoes in years. You got to earn your own money. You're going to be your own man. For every student who joins because you refer them, you get some money. Or you can teach them the introductory classes. So I show them how to earn some money. And then, you know, how to buy the building. So my student owns the building on Bureau Avenue. I sold him the operation back in 97. He got out of Dodge. Got turned off to martial arts in terms of um, from a teacher standpoint. And when you put people in a position of leadership, they start to change sometimes. And I didn't like the idea that I was involved in that mm. that type of thing. But um, then I invented a karate uniform you can wear in the street like a war, so, which is what I have on right now in my pants. But everything has always been about creating a legacy. You know, I was a father age 17, you know, I'm a grandfather now, which I could have been a great grandfather if my son wouldn't have broken the teenage prejudice. I told him, I said, listen, you can do what you want, but it's what I did wrong. I went to the clubs a little too much. If I would have went one tenth of the time, it would have been more than enough. But no, I was obsessive because I'm an entrepreneur. I can go anytime I want. The finances are the issue. I could be in the place on a Sunday. You can't. Right. You know? I could be there on a Wednesday. I could be at the at the, at the album release parties. You know, I could be at the Source Awards. I could be, you know, well, I was all over the place because I had juice. So from hip-hop to freestyle, pretty much I still got it now by accident. I got, I, I'll go somewhere and say, oh, I don't have to say this no more, but they'll know who I am. And they have me go to the club, which I would rather not. I can't. I can't relate to the, to the music it. anymore. It, it, it's the end of May, twenty twenty four. Now, summer twenty twenty four, Paris, Summer Olympics, breaking an Olympic competitive sport. What are your thoughts on that? Break it up. They as soon as they got the potential of that happening about three years ago, I got phone calls from everybody in the position of leadership because they had to think, man, who's the business dude? It was me in terms of America. Right. Over there, it was B-Boy Storm that started most of that from, from Germany. Okay. So he became like the authority, phenomenal dancer, incredible, incredible freaking dancer. When the Europeans came over, mm -hmm. they were doing things we had never seen in breaking because they continued. Influenced by give credit to New York, but think about it. They stopped breaking there. They continued over there. 
they gotta get better. They came back. We were like, yo, we haven't broken years. And they always, they would do from a backspin to a windmill to a head spin to 1990. That's nowhere. Really, I, I don't, we didn't see that in B Street. Right. You know, <laughs> because evolution still start things start to change. But um I love the fact and I already knew that was gonna happen. I visualized a whole bunch of stuff. Just the way my brain works. I said, Lex, in the future, every dance school is gonna teach hip hop. And they're gonna start teaching hip hop history. You're a legend. Over. Oh, you're a legend. When we go back in time, you got Gene Kelly and Fred Astaire and Bo Jangles and Crazy Lex. He was the name, and Rocksteady was the crew that was seen on the big screen. And for whatever it's worth, he was the giant. But everybody else was shorter. So when you're like this and B Street, we're like, yo, who's that dude? Yo, he, he can't, because he's bigger. And I was right. He didn't have that confidence and belief at the time. He was just rich again. 1990. Got it. By the time 1992 comes, now he's starting to become crazy like this guy, which is good and bad. Good in the fact that he had his confidence bad because, it, you know, you got too much. You got to know how to manage that. You know, eventually he got, he got into some problems, you know, years after. But my God, the amount of work he's done throughout the years has been incredible. You can't talk about breaking with crazy, with crazy legs. Everyone was, everybody knows crazy legs. Right. You know, but... And, and he never said he was the best. To me, he was the best because I saw why he was doing so much better than anybody else. I could see 100 people dancing. I could point him out. So it made him unique to him. Was, to me, that made the best. With the beginning, the middle, and the end, which is the three steps of what would be mm-hmm. breaking. Some other guys had better beginning. Some had better middle. And the end something different. But combined, and then with the B-Boy Flea with attitude, now nah, Lex is still my favorite. He, he would say Ken Swift, which I love Ken Swift. Ken Swift is the one that reinvented himself more than ever. So if there's a B-boy that, that, that's probably the best of all time because he went with different times and started different trends, it would be Ken Swift again. All right. It would be Ken Swift. Wow. To me, in my opinion. He created things that they copied and started styles from. When he had limitations to his, to his um, physicality, mm-hmm. injuries, or what have you, he created new curriculums. Wow. Created so new curriculums. you've kind of touched on this a lot. Um, what's the future of b It's 2024. All right, so the way it should be, in my belief, even way back then, and it comes because of martial arts. You mentioned the martial arts, where I mentioned him. Most of these people never made money with martial arts. Not real money. Well, I did. Because I learned how to earn from the people who were earning However, I never rested on my law because my students could whip anyone's butt, and they did. Historical fact. We had three world champions, lightweight, middleweight, and light heavyweight world champion from one school, one year. And it was myself and two of my students. The point is that education is the key. There should be and will be, and there should have been, I should say, rock steady crew Dynamic rockers, dynamic breakers, New York City breakers, dance schools all over the freaking world. That would have been feeding the Olympics and anything else or will be. Because otherwise they just hired help. Auditioning for one spot. Mm-hmm. If it's TV or what have you. Even though break so 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 branding and packaging is gonna be the way to can, can you imagine? Yo, I went to the Rock City Crew School. What style they teach? When they got Crazy Leg style, they got Mr. Wiggle style. Whoa! It's like comf- martial arts schools. That's, that's the way it should be. Honey Rockwell, former down with Rock Study. She actually has a school for over 10 years in, in, in Atlanta, and a lot of her dancers eventually will make it to the Olympics. Right. Because right. they have a small, that's another thing too. I, I laid out what would have been a tournament circuit mindset, like karate. You should have beginner, intermediate, and advanced divisions in the break and two. Why not? Age and because once it gets advanced, you're gonna have, and people. A lot of people involved, then you're gonna have to break it down. Now the advantage of the Olympics is that means that 
some of these people, not just legs and, and, and um, what would be um, fables, will be teaching in universities because they're, they're gonna have to have a degree in dancing if it's in the Olympics, mm -hmm. or they're gonna have their Harvard breaking team. I mean, isn't that what normally happens? Mm -hmm. it, it, it becomes part of what would be mainstream culture. And yeah, I got my mom, I just got my scholarship to breaking, my breaking scholarship to Yale. I mean, come on, think about it. this. Yeah. Is what, if you, they do it for dancing, right? Ballet. You know, so that's what I know is going to happen. Wow. It, 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 it only makes sense. Chronologically, when you go into the future, as long as we're able to package things accordingly, yeah. and we're already respected with the culture, this is part of this. This is part of the historical society. I mean, are you kidding me? This is history. That happened here initially in the Boogie Now box. Got it. So, as a matter of fact, we missed salsa. Salsa actually should be also. That was talk, talk to me about the influence of salsa into b boy. Well, that's my, my, see, this, this is what makes the difference. If you see if, even Wiggins to this very day, he, he does a whole different rocking that's not even good. It's incredible. Just freaking incredible. And he throws in his hips. You throw in those hips. Come on, now. Who's going to move hips like that? A man moving his hips like a Saicedo? Come on, that's what makes the difference when you're doing up rock and you're doing freaking breaking. That's that flavor, the Jonas say pa, Jonas say qua, right. that comes from side side. Doesn't mean they have to be Latino to do it. Cause I seen some freaking Japanese get down some side side, right? And so it doesn't have have nothing to do with some Germans. Too. Are you anybody who's down? You know, and, and and I'm talking about side side, not not what would be, even though it's happened. Mm -hmm. The international dancing side side, they, they're doing that other stuff. That's not the side side from the streets. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, two different side side. But regardless, still, it's still the thing with hips. Yeah. And, um, um, salsa or mambo has influenced hip hop and house in so many different ways because those rhythms, I mean, you, you, the way your hips are moving. Some of the footwork that you've seen, as I said, just do freestyle. Even with, with guys that were in front of the All Star, there was a, a drummer there. His footwork is incredible because he was playing. Remember, if you're doing footwork like playing drums, that means you're doing tap. Mm -hmm. So tap, or what's considered, yeah, jazz dancing is a big influence. Go go back to the Nicholas Brothers and, 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 and not just them alone, not counting all the other ones. So that freestyle or that or, or even the backslide that comes from you know the jazz. They're the first ones that did it. Right. Or would have been the moonwalk as the backslide. You know so. It's just a fusion of stuff. Same thing with her, you know, her, you know so called Native American footwork and standing. That's, that's oh, yeah. part of it, too. And the going war to dance. Circle. Yeah, the war dance. That's, or the Russians, right? The kicking of the Russians. And it, that's what's so incredible today. You see these dancers using their old school cultural dances as part of their routines. So timing doesn't exist. When it comes to that, it comes from anywhere, everywhere. You know? How, how has B Boy changed your life? Well, again, I'm an addict of what would be the day you met me, I'm sure I was sweaty. <laughs> I couldn't stop dancing. I when I met you, you were like the energizer bunny. I'm like, I walk in yeah. and you're moving. Yeah, I walk in the and I'm moving. The entire time yeah. you yeah. did not stop dancing. Yeah. When I sat down, I was dancing. Literally, right? Okay, because it is, I'm one with the music. The sad thing, guys, is that it puts you, music puts you into a spell. The words and even the rhythm, the frequency, puts you into a spell. It does. But it can be a good spell. It can be a good spell because it's called a pattern of truth. Uh -huh. You can be going through some heartache. And my mother had just passed. Can you tell? No one could ever tell. That's right. But I also knew that she celebrated life and she would have been dancing with me. So music is one with the soul, the heart, the beat. We don't need no music. We don't need no, we don't need no, we don't need no, don't need no music. And you can't fake that. Can't fake that. So I am hip hop. Same way everybody else is hip hop who's really hip hop. 
I am also martial arts. I am Bruce Lee. I am one of the greatest of all time of whatever I do. That's the commitment that you're supposed to have in whatever endeavor it is. Now, 94, you're kind of doing your own thing now, but you got a great story, you know, when Castro comes to the Bronx. Fidel Castro. That's crazy. So tell us from the beginning. All right. So I'm part of the National Puerto Rican Business Council during that time, meaning I want to meet other business people who are making an impact in the neighborhood. And Jimmy's Bronx Cafe is the hot spot. That is it. Whether it's politicians, musicians, sports figures, everybody that Jimmy, if you get a chance to get in there, it's packed. And the food is phenomenal. And they serve Puerto Rican food. Oh, please, it's phenomenal. It's, it, it's, okay. So my picture is right there next to Tito Puente. I kick to the top, right next to Tito Puentes, which means I know a lot of people see that picture. So I'm this kid that crossed over into what would be mainstream media. You know, we did Good Day New York, Telemundo, two plus special news. Years ago, on um, the Regis show, it's live with Regis. And I'm in the Source magazine. The first breaker or dancer in the Source magazine, half a page story. There's only 48 pages in that magazine. I got half a page. A year after, there were 348 pages. So imagine that would have been a three-page story. Right. Right? That's me again. I can't, my, my brain just thinks business. So all I'm trying to do is make my parents proud and be a good role model for my children. I think all of us just want to do that. And what we do is what makes that happen. And I'm doing a lot of work with Tony Roberts. I put you in the proper state of mind to walk on fire. I don't mean I read his book. I don't mean that I listen to the, to the tapes. I mean, I'm freaking belly to belly with Tony Roberts. And um, in 1992, I go to Hawaii. Did the mastery course, 14 hours, 14 days of success conditioning with Deepak Chopra and Stephen Covey. I'm learning what people don't know. Next level in terms of communication in the business. So what are you doing? Um, I don't have a GED. Why am I doing this? Because I want to be a good role model. People look up to me. And I don't think I'm a good leader. I know there's room for improvement. So I'm reading and reading and reading, think of good rich, unlimited power. Working with Diamond Rin, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then I start teaching other people how to use these skills, learn linguistic programming, no association condition. Then I hire great grandmaster Aaron Banks as my public relations. See, so I'm developing a team. At the time, he wants me to be the Latino Bruce Lee. I don't like the entertainment industry. It was very, I didn't like it. I was on the set of The Last Dragon in 1984. I saw a lot of things that happened there. Too many homosexual men hitting on me, too. I don't like that. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I'm not homophobic, but keep that over there. I was back as a teenager. So now it's 1994. I have an agent, Michael Amaro, same agent that East Side Morales had, all the top people had. But I don't go to the auditions. Why? I'm already making, you know, six figures plus since 89. So I don't have to kill numbers but to be high. I'm an entrepreneur. I don't even want to be in the movie. Why? Because I want to be a starving actor. My best friend did one movie. That's it. Mass Dragon. Anything after that, pretty much you can't remember. Mm -hmm. So I'm on my own mission. I want to help people become black boys in life. Whatever endeavor you do, become a black boy at it. Become legendary. When you become legendary, it's not up to you, but it's based on the time. And I say, you can be a pioneer in any industry if you put a good five years of kicking butt. A legend, probably about 10. Which is not really the truth because some people just are legendary for that one or two year span and everybody still remembers that and that's what makes it legendary. But I'm trying to give a structure for a legend because people always say, I'm a legend or they're a legend. What the heck? That's, no, a legend is not something you're supposed to say about yourself. It's somebody else's opinion about you. But you should have some type of criteria. We're going to have that. 
if things aren't systematized, then you can't really teach it. So in my school, I taught people how to fight because I had a system to teach them how to fight. But they didn't get into fights because they also knew the student creed. You know, and, and my job as an instructor is to help people get home safe. That's it. What I do is what helps that happen. And that wasn't what I was taught. Mm -hmm. What I was taught was very arrogant, nasty, um, torturing, making the push-ups and all types of crazy stuff. I didn't come here for that. So when I started to teach, I'm not teaching that. Plus, I was a parent. Like, that's child abuse. So I was doing that. And I did a different approach. And I had a 1,000 students and five girls. Four of the five girls, I should say. I became a public speaker and just trying to help people make good decisions. You know, I don't have a GED, but I have people with PhDs work for me. And in 1992, I spoke at NYU. So what you going to do? And it's true. I spoke at NYU in 1992. It was about the business industry. I should say the music industry. And I said, this is it. Music business is always the other way around. It's business and then whatever else. Business, music. Business, dancing. If you have your business together, people respect you. They respect you because the average artist, regardless of his martial arts or any art, are not going to show up on time. And they're going to be about themselves. And they're not going to give. They're not going to want to give too much credit anywhere because they have low self-esteem. They're not in the place where they wanted to be, like most people. Mm -hmm. When I ask the average person, from a scale from one to ten, what level of success have you reached in your life for you? I think I've done about ten percent, but I'm still here. Mm -hmm. I'm only thirteen. Some people say fifty-eight. I'm only thirteen. Five and eight. It's my age. My my business. There's no such thing as time. Time is a notion. Can't bother it. There's no such thing as the past. No such thing as the of future. It's only present, present, present. All the time is present. So that's why we live in multiverses of present. A little crazy, but it's the truth, scientifically proven. So my point is that we have an opportunity to live once, maybe. <coughs> if there's only once, then make the most out of it. Right. Not make excusitis. Excusitis is number one. We have allergies, you and I. Yes. But hopefully we don't have excusitis. Because excusitis, <laughs> allergy may cause you to make an excusitis. Oh, man, I'm sick. I can't do that thing. No, no, you're sick and you do that thing. You know? Because same thing. You got a battle, but you got a, your pinky. You hurt your pinky. Well, you got other fingers, damn it. You learn new techniques. Now you have to do it like that. <laughs> That's what I loved about Mr. Wiggles. Again, I'm biased because it's not the case with just you know, but Mr. Wiggles and Ken Swift. Because of injuries, they develop new techniques of dancing. Yeah? Okay. And, and I love that. They got people who, who really shouldn't be dancing because they're out of shape, but the music gets into them, and you see King of Rock just kill it. Oh, yeah. Wait a minute. What are you doing? You're three months pregnant, bro. You know? Yeah, but... <sighs> <laughs> you know, so it's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to put your life on a whole new level and inspire other people to do it, or maybe because you've been inspired. Because you're looking at guys that are dancing in their fifties and sixties. Now, let me tell you one thing, guys: you have never seen a tap dancer that's out of shape. Those guys, when they're 50, 60, 70, it didn't matter where they were. And look at their bodies. That's a hit. That's a hit. they always in freaking shape. And I don't know if that's important to you, but I want to have my fast feet forever, which is a program I put together. I want to have my feet fast forever. <laughs> fast yeah. feet fontanes. Yes, sir. What does the Bronx mean to you? Again, that's the heartbeat. I was born in Spanish Harlem, and that is the Bronx, because we never separated it too much. You know, it's like Spanish Harlem. The Bronx was almost like the North yeah. Barrio, mm -hmm. and the Barrio was like the South, South, South. Oh. That's right. <laughs> just a little bridge. Just a little. And just a few blocks. Third Avenue Bridge. Yeah, that's it. That's it. Just a few bridge. So, but it's the heartbeat. 
it's the just begun. We learn how to dance. A lot of people realize we learn how to dance because of James Brown. He taught us the one. And the beats. So the heartbeat of the world is the boogie down Bronx. The beat, the Bronx, the B boys could be the beat boys, boogie down Bronx. Without that, the rest of the world would not be dancing like us. Let's keep it real. If it wasn't for the Bronx, it's not just this rap. It's the dance and everything that comes with it. The, the confidence, the flavor, etc. Right. And that's my belief. I really, really honestly believe that. I can always go to the Bronx anywhere in the world. I can go to the Boogie Down Bronx anywhere in the world. Because hip hop, you don't stop. That's right. That's right. You got any uh, last parting words for anyone? Hip hop, you don't stop. When someone says you're too old or you're too young, they never tell you you're the right age. So too young becomes too old. <laughs> yeah. When people are laughing at you, Chances are you're doing the right thing. Because most people are spectators, not participators. And there's never, ever, ever been a statue made for a critic. So it's been for someone who was criticized and went against the odds. Your so-called crazy idea is exactly what you're supposed to do. Because otherwise, someone will take that crazy idea behind your back and make it happen. And then you'll be like, but, but. But they got the patent. They got the trademark. They got the copyright. So if you have an idea, make it happen. Because it already happened when you thought about it. Packaging. And yes, I have to say patenting, trademarking. Can't trademark moves. I go to karate tournaments, I see 95% of the people wearing the copy of my uniform that I invent. If I could stand up for a second. Yeah, please. And this here is called a Rex. R-E-K. But to you, it's a pair of sweatpants. Right. And you see the sign? I put the sign on the angle because hip-hop is always moving. Hip-hop Boulevard. Hip-hop Boulevard. Al Pizarro is the actual trademark owner of that. See? And of course, farm to this. So branding is important, guys. It's you ink. You ink. You ink, and you can make an ink. LOC, preferably initially. You know, financial literacy is as important as everything else. Left side of your brain, your right side of your brain, the yin and the yang. And if you don't have both, someone's going to come and pimp you. You can pimp yourself. It's called marketing. You can do a joint venture. It's called pimping whoever. And you can always switch up and put another person in the foreground. So get your business together. Learn how to earn because you can never lose out when it comes to that. And the only other thing I can say is give credit where it's due. The people who influenced you, there's nothing wrong with saying the truth. You know, you don't have to bite, you can rewrite and give credit. <laughs> awesome, awesome. For the Bronx Hip Hop Oral History Project. Grandmaster Jerry Fastbeat Fontanez, thank you. Yeah, it's my pleasure. Now, in my TV show, I used to do something like this. When I say A, B, you say C, ya. A, B, C, ya. we out of here. Thank you very much. Peace. Peace.